Welcome back to the Comics Course, an offering of Miskatonic University's remote education program, offering graphical literature and society and history as a publicly available podcast. As always, you can find me on social media, especially at Prof Hamby, P-R-O-F-H-A-M-B-Y on Twitter. I am your ever erudite Professor Hamby, along with my ever... Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I know you know how to read. Are other art students still learn how to read? Yes. Okay. I just, I've, I have some in classes sometimes and they don't seem to know how to. Okay. Anyway, this is my T.A. Rowan, who, uh, does not like me slandering her fellow students. Um, you know, but, you know, I call it like I see it. So we're going to get back to our root beer tasting. Now, I, I, I'm going to say up front, uh, we have, in fact, both tried this one before. Mm -hmm. And th this is not one we're looking forward to doing on the podcast, but we kind of have to. It is Zevia Zero Calorie Soda. First of all, we have not had good luck with zero calorie root beers. And this one has ginger added to it. It even smells now, nasty. It, has, it is natural ginger, so supposedly this is he healthy or some shit. Um, I also don't think root beer should be clear. That bugs me. No. All right, let's do it. Mm. Yeah, ginger does not go with root beer, folks. It does not. So what you want from root beer is a sweet creaminess combined with strong sassafras flavor. There's no cream in there. It's not creamy, and I cannot really taste the sassafras. No, I I, can... I just taste the ginger. Yeah, same, just the ginger. And I don't, yeah, they just don't go together. Now, this next one, neither of us have tried, Ooh. but we do have to give a, we'll give a score after we've tried both. This is prebiotic root beer. Mm. So it's supposed to be for a healthy gut. It's Poppy brand. It says, be gut happy, be gut healthy. I don't like it when sodas brand themselves as healthy. It's not a good sign because sodas are inherently unhealthy. Yeah. And it says it's prebiotic. I thought the term was probiotic. Am I confusing things here? Am I addled in my dotage here? I don't know. It has an okay color. I can still taste the ginger. It's very foamy. I just got some on my foot. So my foot's going to smell of this now. It doesn't smell bad, does it? It doesn't smell bad, but it doesn't smell like root beer to me. All right, I'm going to take a small sip first. Oh, I don't like that smell. Oh, oh God. Oh, God, somehow it's worse. <laughs> oh, that's awful. Oh, my God, that's bad. Oh, that's a tra that is a travesty against God and nature. I did not think it could be worse than the other one, but Jesus. No, we were, you were so, so wrong. That is foul. <laughs> that makes the other one a 10. <laughs> Jesus. How are they still... How are they, why are they still making these? I don't know. How did it get past production? I don't know. That's getting poured out though. That's that's foul on every level. That I I might give that to somebody I disliked, but nobody I I, I liked or felt neutral about. Oh, blah blah blah. Hold on, we need a palate cleanser after that. I knew it was a bad sign when it didn't even smell good. All right. Oh, that was... That was horrid. I think that was a hate crime. <laughs> it was a hate crime against taste buds. Oh, my Lord. By Odin's hammer, or Thor's hammer, or whatever. Oh, that's much better. Um, Odin was more known for having a spear than a hammer. 
<laughs> but that taste was so bad it scrambled the neurons in my brain. Same. My whole brain lit up with, oh, no, destroy that. I mean, I actually had a compulsive urge to stand up and run outside and pour it out. I mean, it's sheer presence next to me on the table is offending me now. Oh. oh it's so gross. So gross. So speaking of gross, that brings us to our topic of today. Um, well, the good and the bad, the polarity. So, by the way, I will be adding reviews of these, so we do need quick numbers for them. The Zevia, th that's a two? That's a two, and then the other one is a minus 1,000. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm kind of tempted to say the Zevia is actually a one, and the other one, for the first time ever, earns a negative score of negative one. Yeah, definitely. That, oh, Lord. Because that's undrinkable. The Stevia is at least Right, drinkable. it's drinkable. The other one actually made me have a physically negative response. Mm -hmm. Not just it doesn't taste good, but like expel this from uh -huh. me. Oh, okay. Um, the good and the bad. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh -huh. We're going to talk about uh, eight comics. And groups of four, where we're going to take some similarities of a single idea, and are they implemented well or badly? Okay. And we're going to look at one where it's implemented well, and one where it's implemented badly. And we're going to... Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse you, <laughs> frat boy Rowan. Uh, we're going to start with King Conan by Jason Aaron. Uh, Marvel has a long history of publishing Conan magazines and comics. And they're back at it with King Conan. They've been doing Conan pretty regularly for the last few years. Mm -hmm. And have just generally done a pretty decent job. Now, Jason Aaron uh, has a couple of interesting trivia bits as a writer, one of which I want to share, is that his cousin wrote the script for Full Metal Jacket. Now, you're a little bit younger, so you may not remember this, but it was one of the great war movies of the 80s mm. uh, that dealt with the Vietnam War in a very intelligent way. It was a very good movie. And Jason Aaron himself, his name has come up on the podcast before. He broke through really working for DC, uh, their Vertigo imprint, and wrote Scalped, which I mentioned on an episode where I highlighted indigenous American stories. Mm -hmm. uh, Scalped has often been called the only... Uh, uh, Native American noir series. Uh, and I think it's very good. And he also wrote the reboot of Thor that introduced Jane Foster as the mighty Thor, which was used as the basis of her role in the recent Thor Love and Thunder film. Mm. So, I, you know, he's a storyteller that I think is good. But, you know, aside from Scalped, he was never a writer I really followed a lot. I mean, I thought he did a good job with Thor. Um, but Thor is a Thor is one of those mainstream Marvel titles where writers come and go. And it, it doesn't feel like it's worth following as a series to me most of the time. Because you just get invested in something and then the writer gets moved off and then it falls to crap. And it's like, well, I'm frustrated and annoyed as a reader now. Mm -hmm. But... This was Conan, and I actually picked this up because of the one I'm going to talk about next, the bad Conan-related story. And I'm glad that prompted me because I'm really enjoying King Conan. This is now becoming one of my regular monthly reads. Mm -hmm. And so for those who aren't familiar with the premise of Conan, he was originally created uh, by one of the great pulp writers... Uh, back in the 1920s, and he, hype, he, he he wrote up a whole essay about the Hyperborean Age, the sort of mythical age of the world. And Conan was not as mindless as he's been often represented in the movies and stuff. In fact, in the original stories, Conan was a thief. He wasn't just... He was a barbarian, but he was as likely, perhaps even more likely, to try to sneak into a building to steal stuff as he was to swing a sword and clash with people. Mm. So, I mean, he was an accomplished fighter, he was a barbarian, but he was also sneaky and a thief. Never particularly educated, but that doesn't mean not smart. 
and a more complex figure than perhaps the Conan movies have given him credit for. Although I have not watched the Jason Momoa Conan movie yet. I understand it did not do well, but that doesn't mean it's not good. I still plan to watch it at some point. So, King Conan takes place after he's been the king of his own kingdom for a long time, and in fact now has an adult son. <laughs> and as the story opens, it's in media res. Are, are you familiar with the term in media res? No. It is, I'm kind of surprised you don't learn it in art classes, uh, but it means literally f to appear in the middle of the action. Mm. And it's often used in art to indicate when an art happens, like in the middle of an action sequence mm. or something. It, and this happens, um, you open it up, and it says, King Conan, Conan's last stand at the edge of the world, part one, on maggot-infested waves. Ooh. That's a hell of a title. I love mm. it. I mean, this is pure pulp. And then as our first page opens... And I guess I should give some credits here for art. Mah uh, Mahmoud Asar is the main artist. He also it does the color art on some pages. Matthew Wilson also does colors. And they work together seamlessly. Uh, so I and, and Asar only did three pages so or four pages. So I'm guessing Matthew Wilson was the primary colorist and maybe couldn't get some done. And Asar uh, filled in. Uh, but you don't notice it as you're going through it. And his art is wonderful. And we open up on page one with Conan's head breaking out of the waves, trying to get a gasp of air. He's swimming. Then he starts swimming, and there are planks of wood. Obviously, something has happened. Maybe his ships have crashed. He crawls up on the rocky edge of a shore, coughing. And we see maggots literally in the waters. Oh. Ew. And then he's on this beach, littered with shipwrecks and dead bodies and maggots everywhere. And we see that he is an older Conan. He's still very buff. He's very strong. But there's gray in that beard, which is not as wild as it may once have been. And I'm not going to go through this story by, you know, story bit by bit. There's four or five issues out now. And it unveils its story gradually both what's happening to Conan on the island and through a series of flashbacks, how he came to be there. And honestly, this is one of the best uses of flashbacks in fiction I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. The way it's parsed out is not confusing. It's linear. It makes you wait for it. And it makes the payoff for the end of the flashbacks all the stronger. Really wonderfully done. And we find out that ultimately in the end, he's no longer king. He had planned to banish his son to make his son tougher and stronger like him. And essentially the son turns the tables on him and is like, you're right. I'm not a barbarian. I, I, I'm a king. I was raised to be a king by one of the toughest, most pain in the ass sons of bitches on earth, you. And you never had to re deal with yourself as a father. And I did. Then, and I'm not weak. And I've done every shitty job in this kingdom so that I have to know what everybody in this kingdom has done. And I know what it takes to feed people. I know the finances. I know shit you don't know. And I'm not interested in running off and being a barbarian. I want to be what I was raised to be, which is the king. And then Conan kind of exiles himself. Wow. <laughs> and it's like... You know, because his son basically says, you're not happy. You want to be out on the edge of the world fighting. Verbal bitch slap. It was. And it was done masterfully. And the roles were reversed in a beautiful way. And where you expect this indig indignant, childlike behavior from Conan, he instead is like, you're right. And you're an incredible, amazing man. And you're going to be an amazing king. And I'm so proud of you, my son. Mm. And we see this maturity and emotional development. And this is stretched out over five issues and flashbacks. While at the meantime, there's a storyline going on with him, 
and a and a wizard who's been his enemy since the earliest stories and these new figures and it is just the best of pulp in all possible ways and so we get these parallel stories with this brilliantly built flashbacks um combined with the best action and twists of pulp with with humor and horror and machismo and it's all done beautifully so and, and the art is perfect the art is amazing yeah the coloring is beautiful and yeah it's just and, and look at the flashback art oh that's gorgeous yeah it, it switches to this sort of pastel set of color tones and it's a really nice way to show that it's a flashback without making it jarring. Right. Because it's different. And it's sort of a little softer, like memory can be. But it's, it's still, not radically different. It's basically a slight alternate version of the main art style. Right. All of it's very well done. Wonderful series. King Conan being ridden by... Um, um, why am I suddenly... Uh, Jason Aaron, published by Marvel. Great current read. Great read. And that brings us to the series that had me go check it. Now, some of this source material is now in the public domain, which means anybody can work on it. Uh, Robert Howard's original Conan stories, I think, are public domain now. Uh, not all of them necessarily, but some are. And two of the characters from Conan stories were Belette and Valeria. Both were described as pirates and represented in certain ways. This is the cover for the first issue here. Of, and the title is called Belette and Valeria, Swords vs. Sorcery. You can just tell by the cover they're going to treat them as individuals. You can just tell. <laughs> as well-rounded people. Mm -hmm. And now, not just as figures with boobas. <laughs> yeah, you'd hope, right? Um, I was attracted to this series because, in part, I like the idea of taking female characters from, you know, source material like Howard's Conan and then doing their own stories with them mm -hmm. and making them interesting. And if I get to read that along with beautiful art of sexy women, then it's all win in my book. Mm -hmm. That's not what happened as I read it, unfortunately. Now, they take great effort here. This is written by Max Bemis, art by Rodney Buccini. Uh, they make great effort to tie this back to the Robert Howard stories. You know, on the title page, they talk about Bolette being introduced in Weird Tales in 1934, and then Valeria in July of 36. At the back of the book, they have serialized the publication of Howard's essay on the Hyperborean Age, which continues through the issues. So they're very concerned with connecting this to the source material. And I will say, I don't personally feel that Robert Howard was as sexist as some people would like to characterize him. In fact, I would argue that the pulp era was not nearly as sexist as people assume it was. The time period after the pulp era was actually more sexist than the pulp era was. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's a lot of fascinating publication history that has been buried from the pulp era. For example, there was a whole company in New York City dedicated to publishing urban lesbian fiction at the time. Mm -hmm. Whole novels. The fact is, as a country, um, we have this mythology that we were always become more liberal. That we were super conservative and we become more liberal. And that's not true. We've had time periods where we've regressed and become more conservative. Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say that the pulp writers were, you know, particularly super enlightened. Mm -hmm. I've it's, seen covers. It's not to say that Robert Howard himself was always great about this. Just not as bad as some people would like to say. You know, it, people of general... I mean, Robert Howard did write some strong female characters. And in this particular one, there is an odd irony in that it opens kind of like Conan did because one of the female protagonists literally crawls out of the sand underneath the sea and swims up to shore. Mm -hmm. And she apparently has been raised from the dead after a shipwreck. And they use some strategic elements to 
hide the naughtiest bits, as some people would say. And she walks out on shore amongst a bunch of mermaids for no story reason whatsoever, who also have very large breasts with strategic covering. There's absolutely no story reason for this. Um, and as the pages go on, it just becomes cringier and cringier. She walks into a bar, kicks, literally kicks in the door for no reason whatsoever. So there's now a shattered door and she yells, attention, gutter apes, fetch me some of that grapeless wheat piss you Neanderthals use to kill your scant brain cells. By the way, they didn't think about, you know, alcohol as killing brain cells back when Howard was writing. And supply me with the most formidable cock amongst you, if the rest of you can stand apart with it. So, you know, she's yelling that basically they're a bunch of fags. And uh, using this as an insult. Not particularly enlightened in this day and age. And basically having her act as masculine as possible to show how desirable she'd be. Because, you know, apparently the goal of a desirable woman is to be extremely masculine while having big tits. Yeah. And the characterization does not deepen from here at all. I'm just saying it's a red flag when the moment you start the series and the main female character is naked for half of it. Yeah, it doesn't get better. And then when the other... So I kept reading going, okay, well, when the next character is introduced, this will get better. Um, she just spends all of her time tied up and, you know, kind of some BDSM bondage fantasies. <sighs> now, this other character, I will say, was kind of a... It was represented when she was originally written by Howard as a strong female character, but spent time tied up. I mean, let, let's also remember, Howard was writing for an audience. And, you know, he did use titillating content. But she was also only ever in one story. So the fact that she was a damsel in distress, despite being a strong female character, I don't think is very fair to generalize for a whole character when she was only ever in one story. Mm -hmm. But obviously they're riffing on that here. And I also just want to point out, look at how much dialogue is on the pages. Oh, that's, that's, you can't read that. It just keeps going and going and going. I mean, the writer loves dialogue. And the artist clearly didn't... They gave him so much, the artist didn't know how to correctly put it in to make it work with the pages they right. were told. There's so much that it's hard to follow. And there are times the plot is so convoluted with people backstabbing each other that you can't follow the plot twists. Mm -hmm. it's, now, the art isn't bad. The art is okay. Mm -hmm. But the writing is just awful. And, you know, they make efforts to throw cool elements in. Hey, here's a giant demon snake that shows up. They actually managed to make a giant demon snake boring. Oh. I mean, that's, that's a sin against writing. That's extremely disappointing. And at the critical moment, how does the blonde sorceress change the tides of things after the sorcerer summons the giant demon snake. Which, by the way, I had to like go back and reread like three times to figure out what was going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how unnecessarily convoluted it is. Mm. And it wants to connect to Pulp, but you did not have to reread things three times in Pulp to figure out what was going on. Mm -hmm. Nor in King Conan. But how does she? Does she make a dramatic action? Does she throw a sword? Does she come up with a cunning plan? Does she break out some until now, unshown mystic skills. No, she shows her tits to distract the sorcerer. <sighs> now... When will people tell men this isn't funny? It's, it's just objectifying. It, it's not objectifying, because she's not being treated as an object. But what she is being treated as is an entity whose only function is to have a pair of tits. That's objectifying. No, objectifying is when somebody is treated as an object. An inanimate object. The term objectification gets used wrong a lot. This is a bad thing, but it's not technically objectification. Mm. Objectification is when you treat people as objects. Well, treating her as just a pair of tits is treating her as an object. I think there's an argument to be made for that. Um, it's certainly dehumanizing. 
I would argue it's more like being treated like cattle, which is not objectification, but really bad. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that makes it a good thing. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I have nothing... You know, if somebody wants to write a good sword and sorcery series with two topless women running around doing stuff, I'm down to read and look at this. But it needs to actually be well-written, and this is not. This is just awful. Mm -hmm. um, and when your protagonists are female, uh, you know, writing them from a just really juvenile, sexist, male perspective gaze um, is not good. And, and there's nothing that makes them engaging as protagonists here. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, stay away from Bullet and Valeria. It's not good. Read King Conan, tragically. Mm-hmm. Because I was actually excited for it. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't excited for King Conan. So there you know, there you go. You get surprised, right? Mm -hmm. So now let's move on to a good and bad example of trying to do a big idea. Now, I didn't even bring an issue to show you, Rowan, of the one I'm going to mention is a bad idea. Mm -hmm. uh, it is Dark Crisis. This is the new universe-ending crisis from DC Comics. Oh, how, how It's tragic. the end of the universe, the multiverse, the omniverse. See, this is how stupid the, these universe crises become. It's like, you know, little kids on the playground. Well, I destroyed the world. Well, I destroyed the solar system. Well, I'm going to write a series that destroys the galaxy. Well, I'll write a series that destroys the universe. Well, I'll write a series that destroys the multiverse. Well, I'll write a series that destroys the 52 multiverse. Well, I'll write a series that destroys the Omniverse. You know, it, it, it's this kind of escalation is not fun or engaging to read. It's childish. I mean, it, it's silly. It's ridiculous. The 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 man children and woman children that this stuff is written for at this point, I just don't get it. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is... Do you know what the actual definition of pornography is? No. Uh, there are different definitions depending on exactly what source you're using. Um, and, and the way we use the term, it usually means... Uh, uh, well, if it's used casually in a non-legal context, it means things of purient interest. You know, things of adult explicitness. Mm -hmm. But legally, it has to have no artistic or cultural or scientific value of any kind. Mm -hmm. Which is one of the ways, classically, that people who've produced adult material try to get around not being labeled as pornography in a legal sense is, you know, for example, bringing on people and saying, hey, yeah, there's there's health relevance here. Um, you know, it's good for people with these, you know, people learn stuff for their relationships or whatever. Sometimes these arguments are questionable, whatever. Um, to me... These kinds of superhero comics where everything's escalating is essentially pornography. Not in the adult sense, but in the sense of having no artistic or cultural value of any kind. It, it's just Michael Bay movies on paper. Today, we have a Michael Bay film. Like you've never seen before. Transformers 37. Every robot fires a bullet that blows up a moon. Every robot step shakes the whole planet. We're not actually going to show you the robots. It's just going to be an hour and a half of explosions. And, and I mean, that's kind of what this stuff is. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's boring. If you continue escalating and escalating and escalating... Eventually, it all becomes mundane. Whoops. The hounds are at it again. Well, they did not approve. Nope, they did not. Um, apparently, the hounds are Michael Bay fans. Who knew? But it's boring. It's uninteresting. I knew someone treated those dogs wrong. Yep. So, I mean, when you're reading a book that's about subverting expectations, supposedly... But everything is constantly subverted as they try to make bigger and bigger and bigger still cool. It, it, at some point, it just none of it matters. Mm -hmm. You you want to do something that will shock me? 
go 10 years without destroying the universe in your in your company. That'll shock the hell out of me. Then maybe it being destroyed will actually mean something. Right. I mean, what started this was Crisis on Infinite Earths. Nobody had done it before. And it was mind-blowing. It was emotional. Despite being superhero comics. Mm -hmm. This is just... Dull. Meanwhile, over at Image Comics, we have a series called Eight Billion Genies. Now, this was interesting. Uh, Siri thinks I want to call somebody named Eight Billion Genius. No, Siri, I do not. No, Siri, I don't want to call anybody. Now, 8 Billion Genies is by Charles Soule and Ryan Brown. And it takes that simple idea and makes it huge. Just like they supposedly were trying to do with Dark Crisis. So, this one opens on some people looking around and a kid going into what looks like a rundown bar mm -hmm. called The Lampwick. The art is pretty simple, but effective, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, the color palette is on the dark and gray-brown side. The moody side. Moody side. And about ten pages in, in a world of complete normality, you know, there's some drama happening with people in the, ba with the band that had been playing on stage, and there's a kid there looking for his dad, and... He obviously knows the bar well, and the bar owner knows the kid, and this kind of stuff is happening. And then suddenly, these weird shapes just appear in the air. They look like little cartoon versions of people. Ooh. And one appears for every human on the planet. Eight billion of them, including the infants. Oh, welcome to life. And they describe themselves as genies. Huh. Oop, I think they're one assistant professor. Uh -uh. Um, How sad. And each genie gives each human one wish. Oh, no. Reality altering anything you want wishes. And there's eight billion of them. Eight billion overlapping wishes. That's not good. So the bartender, in a moment of extreme susness, including as commented on by the other people, just has... An answer for what he wants immediately. Mm -hmm. I wish that no wish, wish made outside this bar can affect this bar or anyone or anything inside it. Wait, couldn't someone just wish that none of these wishes ever happened? Maybe in theory, but they actually explain that later. Because of the chaos of the wishes interacting with other wishes, there are some things they won't do. Okay. And there are some things they simplify. So, for example, if a whole bunch of people wish for the same thing, their wishes are condensed together. Mm. Or coalesced together, I should say. So, I mean, so within the first eight seconds, chaos reigns. By in, Within the first eight minutes, Earth is transformed into a cube. Oh, God. Who wished for Minecraft? Right. And it, it just gets weirder from there. So this is an example of how they've taken a single big idea and then they play it out and they roll with it. And it gets crazy. I mean, really bizarre, psycho crazy. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of glorious. And of course, within the first day, pe there are people who start wishing for superpowers. Mm -hmm. Somebody out looks outside and goes, oh my God, the city's on fire. And somebody else says, yeah, one of the genies says, yeah, that's a result of somebody wishing for a lightsaber. Oh. Oh. And the genies will answer some questions, if they want to. Um. And somebody says, well, such and such rule of yours isn't fair. And they said, we're giving you wishes. We didn't tell you we'd be fair. <laughs> we can remake the rules anytime we want. <laughs> And this is why you don't trust unknowing, small, cute beings. Right. I mean, at one point, this guy looks outside the bar, and there's a monster truck filled with gold driving by, 
while a guy in a mecha suit is shooting lasers at something, and there are rocket ships and giant castles and aliens and dinosaurs, and, you know, the results of all these wishes. And it looks like a giant pizza man. It might be a giant pizza man. So that's 8 Billion Genies. Uh, I'm an issue or two behind, but I'm enjoying it. Mm. But I, I'm a sucker for this kind of thing. Take a big idea and explore it and as much rational outcome as you can. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I love that. And these people act like people. Mm -hmm. That's, of course, one of my problems with, you know, something like Bolette and Valeria. They don't act like people. They act like male fantasies. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I don't like Dark Crisis you know, at some point, these superheroes who've been through all these crises have to be sick of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next one is really interesting to me because Marvel has decided that there will be ongoing two Captain Americas. Mm. The original Captain America, of course, Steve Rogers, and Sam Wilson will continue to be Captain America. So they've relaunched a new series for both of them separately. Uh, one called Sentinel of Liberty and one called Symbol of Truth. So it's Captain America, Sentinel of Liberty, which stars Steve Rogers, Captain America. And then a Sam Wilson, Captain America, Symbol of Truth, starring Sam Wilson as Captain America. And they did an issue zero with both of them and then split them into their own titles that start at number one at the same time. So we get to compare two different implementations of Captain America. Now, one of the iconic things for Captain America, of course, is his shield. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely iconic. And yet, there's been very little ever really established or talked about where his shield came from. Mm -hmm. So we see in the opening pages this middle-aged black man working on forging the shield in 1941. Mm -hmm. And the storyline goes on with Steve Rogers, who's living back in Brooklyn again, or, sorry, Lower East Side of Manhattan. And, you, you know, he just knows people. He's just walking around like a normal guy. Except he goes jogging with the shield because people love to see it. And the storyline is getting into the history of the shield. And the secrets people don't know about it, and things are being revealed. And it is bringing up some questions about about the role of things like African-Americans who served the war effort and were never recognized for it. Mm -hmm. And it's being done with a very subtle hand, and it leaves you curious about what are these secrets of the shields of the shield? Mm -hmm. Is there something dirty and foul in the history of Captain America that he himself doesn't know about mm -hmm. that might cast a negative angle on it. And it's not the first time this sort of story has been done. I mean, the revelation of uh, uh, the first Captain America, effectively, or at least first creation of a super soldier program in America, who was black mm -hmm. and mistreated by the government, uh, was done a few years ago and handled well. Now, this is the Captain America uh, symbol of liberty. Ironically, the Sam Wilson one is called Symbol of Truth, and I think these titles should have been reversed uh, because something about truth is central to the Steve Rogers story, but doesn't seem to be for uh, the Sam Wilson one. And the Sam Wilson one is kind of messy. Now, of course, Sam Wilson is an African-American. Uh, he has a person of color as a sort of cohort here. And they start with stopping the robbing of a train before switching to Sam going through New York with Misty Knight, uh, another long-running African-American character in Marvel Comics. Mm. And the only hint we really have about where this is going is that there is some movement of people outside uh, with this slogan of Wakanda Forever, which is a clear tie-in to the upcoming uh, Black Panther Marvel movie. And clearly there's something going on with race relations and African-Americans. And yet it's not really well communicated what theme they're looking to develop here. 
or where the plot is going, and it's kind of a mess. Now, I hope over the next few issues that this gets cleaned up, but they're clearly, in order to try to promote the visibility of Sam Wilson as Captain America, they're trying to tie him in to the Black Panther mythos some. And in fact, so this figure who shows up uh, at the end as a likely antagonist is the White Wolf. Oh. The, T'Challa's adopted brother and longtime antagonist. So there's clearly a whole setup going here but we don't have a good sense of a starting point from the first issue. I mean, he just kind of runs around. <laughs> so, certainly, you know, when I talk about bad, um, Dark Crisis, awful. Bullet and Valeria, awful. This was not awful. But compared to the other one, it was pretty weak. Which is a shame, because what I wanted to see was two things that both would compel me to reading Captain America stories as different parts of the American experience. And ironically, at least so far, the part of it that deals with the complicated problem of racial treatment in America's history, which is a big problem. I mean, not just historically, but today ongoing as well. Um, seems like they're setting it up better for the white Captain America than the black Captain America. Which seems kind of weird to me. That doesn't sound right. Because you'd think that the Sam Wilson would be the better character to explore that through. You would think. But they're being really heavy-handed and yet not showing direction. And I understand it's a serial. I understand that you don't have to show all your cards at once. But I don't feel like we've been shown any cards. Which isn't a good thing. Yeah. Okay, last one. I'm going to try to go through these quickly. But this last one is an awaited return of a character. And these are both from DC. So when we did uh, a look at Asian, his, uh, Asian Culture Month uh, a while back, we discussed the introduction in that anthology from DC of the Monkey Prince. Oh, now, I, I hate the name Monkey Prince. I hate it so much. I hate this origin actually tied to the Monkey King um, it, it, it doesn't feel right. It It is written by somebody of Chinese heritage. And the costume looks so stupid on the cover. It is so stupid. They're emphasizing his Asian-ness. So there's an M on the front because everybody knows that, you know, in China, they use the Roman alphabet. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm trying to think how to say this. So... Let's say somebody woke up at, at, you know, one of the major, you know, entertainment comics companies and said, we need more diverse characters. <laughs> so we need to introduce an Irish character. Yeah, we'll call him Shamrock and give him luck powers. Do you know anything of Ireland other than four leaf clovers and kissing the Blarney Stone and leprechauns? No. Nah, that's all they have to their culture, right? No. <laughs> I mean, this is what it feels like. The Monkey Prince feels like. China, China, China. Um, well, you know, I, I took an international lit class in undergrad, and they mentioned Monkey Goes West. That's going to be the best cultural touchstone for them, right? I mean, if you went up to the average Chinese citizen and said this... I suspect you would get the same sort of reactions you would in the West if you went up to people and went, Hey, Rowan, mm -hmm. if I make a superhero out of Zeus, I'll be super culturally relevant for you, right? No. I mean, Zeus is from uh, class from Greece in a time period that's the foundation of your culture. So, I mean, it feels super relevant to you, right? No. And also, Zeus was creepy. And... I mean, but you kids, I mean, Zeus is like what you talk about as a hero every day and is a cultural touchstone for you in your modern culture, right? Definitely. I mean, even though the stories are from thousands of years ago and the only versions told are the retellings from thousands of years ago. I mean, that's what they did with the monkey <laughs> prince here. I mean, it's stupid. I'm not Chinese, but I'm willing to bet that 
a huge ass nation of people with a vibrant rich culture have way more to draw on than the monkey king Mm -hmm. and yet it's what gets read and i do know that it is still relevant to them there are new chinese films made about the monkey king but there are new films used with greek heroes too that doesn't mean that this should be your only touchstone for the culture Mm -hmm. um it, it and so i found it kind of painful and the humor they attempted to make him into a humorous character. I think they were going for something Deadpool like, but not as raunchy or vulgar. Maybe more Peter Parker. Maybe, yeah, maybe a little more uh, Spider Man ish. And it didn't work. It did not work at all. Um, there, there were some plot elements with interesting potential. Like, his parents are actually, you know, supervillain henchmen, hench people. Mm. You know, he's afraid of Batman because he once saw Batman beat up his parents. He's actually becoming friends with Damian Wayne at the high school while in their superhuman personas they can't stand each other. Mm. You know, th- these are okay elements. Cliched, but okay. But kind of fun. But... The humor is forced and never really clicks. And it feels like they're trying to be racially sensitive and it, and they're just plodding and actually... I, I wouldn't call it racially insensitive, but clue, racially clueless. Does that make mm, sense? Yeah. Because they are trying to be sensitive, and I'll give them credit for that. Or at least trying to be diverse. That's mm. probably a better term here. You know, they're, they're, they're clueless in their attempts at diversity, but at least they are trying. Meanwhile, another character that many of us have awaited return is Poison Ivy. Hey. Now, since the series where she and Harley broke up and it was revealed that, you know, there was fuckery going on with her head and her uh, uh, physical being, I- I've been waiting to see what they do with her. And... I'm loving this series. I love it. I mean, first of all, the art is just beautiful. Oh, that's gorgeous. And they've kind of taken her from anti-hero to just pure borderline sociopath here. And But without drama. She's not out to destroy the world by doing some huge event that draws superhero attention. She's basically driving around the country spreading these spores to eliminate humanity. And being chill about it and interacting with people as she goes. That's fun. I'm kind of and tired of big, of big villains that people grow to love and then being like, okay, we gotta make them good now. Yeah. And this is kind of a return to the most anti-version of her anti-hero. And some of the scenes are just grotesque. But beautifully grotesque. And reading her is... It's hypnotic. Mm-hmm. It, it's... She's crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's really crazy, and she knows she is. And she's mentally unstable. And it's captivating to Mm. read her mindset. Um, It's absolutely brilliant. It felt like I I literally had Nick Cave's red right hand playing as theme music to this in my head while I read it. Mm. So just brilliant. All right, we're approaching the 50-minute mark, so I'll wrap it up. But I thought those were good examples of where people take the same sort of idea. Uh, You know, resurrecting a Robert Howard Conan character and reinventing him for a modern story. Returning to a character that hasn't been around, but whose promise, whose return was promised by earlier works. Uh, Two different iterations of Captain America. uh, Two implementations of big ideas. And seeing what worked and what didn't and why. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and, of course, the result of this is some of these elements may become parts of ongoing mythologies while others don't. Eight Billion Genies is going to be a standalone story. But if we look at things like Monkey Prince and Poison Ivy here, I think that unless somebody else creates a Monkey Prince story that's really engaging, he's going to be a trivia question in a few years. Meanwhile, Poison Ivy is a character that has endured, and this is going to become a part of her ongoing story. Mm -hmm. So, really interesting stuff in that regards. In that regard to me. Mm -hmm. Any final thoughts before we sign off 
for the day uh, because after we sign off, I'm going to pour both these just nasty foul root beers out. No, I don't have anything else to say other than please get those out of this office. I will do that. And so we'll sign off and we'll be back next week with Sandman and another episode. Mm -hmm. Keep reading comics, folks. <laughs>